Yes, I was speaking, but my microphone disconnected itself. Sorry about that, everybody. Let's try again. Um, okay, welcome everybody to this Aussie Live session with Joe Freitag, who's going to tell us about signposts for Roman riders. Joe is um, the person who runs the Gifted Resources website and is also responsible for Sprite Site, which has fabulous um, posts about Sprite. And I think, I'm hoping Joe will share her website with us later in the session. Okay, um, Joe's a regular participant in our Friday morning Karen to keep on focus sessions where she's done quite a few webinars. So I'll just carry on with the introductory stuff. Yes, I did start the recording. And I need to thank our sponsors. Um, this is an Australian series and learning revolution combined effort. Steve Hargadon's Learning Revolution has um, involvement in loads of conferences around the world. And of course, Blackboard Collaborate, Coach Carol and Chambles, who have done phenomenal amounts of work towards getting this running, and our sponsor, Seabuck Academy. Okay. Now, the good old familiar map, where you can um, add yourself to the map wherever in the world you are. And Okay, Lisa, have you tried dropping your connection speed back a notch? That might help. Okay. Joe, I'm dropping the mic and saying let everybody make Joe very welcome and go ahead, Joe. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, could I have a smiley face if you can hear me, please? Thanks, Joe. And Phil, thank you. Um, yes, well, moving along. Um, this is my session, um, signposts for Roman riders. And thank you, Joe, for the, the introduction. Um, <coughs> we're going to be talking about <coughs> about what um, people understand when they hear the word gifted um, and how it different how it's different from some other similar terms and we're going to also um, uh, talk about what gifted resources can do uh, to help um, people find information they need so <coughs> we're going to ask who you all are, so that we can uh, see who the audience is. Um, uh, we, I know we've got <coughs> a techie here, that's Phil, um, and teachers. Um, so if you put a, yes, put a tick or put a, um, a smile or put something else. Uh, oh, poor Lisa's having a lot of trouble with getting into the session. Um, you can certainly tick more than one <coughs> box. Um, you know, if you're a parent and a teacher, or a teacher and a techie, or <coughs> um, and with the on Twitter. If you'd like to put that into your um, chat also, um, I hope there might be some friends of Sprite in here. <laughs> hmm. Thanks, Joe and Phil. On at Joe Fry. Um, okay. How 
are you going, Luis? Are you able to hear? Can I have a smiley if you're hearing? Lisa seems to be writing. Um, oh, no, she's dropped out again. Oh, dear. Okay, well, I'll move on um, to the next slide. What do you mean when you say gifted? Oh, Lisa's back again. When you hear somebody say that a student is gifted, what does that make you think? <laughs> That's wise, Phil. <laughs> <coughs> Um, the thing about it is that different people <coughs> use the term in different ways and some people when they say it, they, yes, they say, mean that the, the student's particularly good at something or um, they, mean, they may mean that they're a very high achieving student or um, they may mean that they appear to have come from a, a different planet, that they're quite different from <laughs> some of the other students in the class. But we'll have a look at, um, at this and see what I think about what gifted is. Ah, hello Sue. So would you like to add on the onto the board here, what do you think when you hear the term gifted? The students gifted. Yes, the student has a talent in one or more areas. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, sometimes I hear others use it as a synonym for different or sometimes difficult. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well. We're going to liken a whole class to a class full of people learning riding. Um, this is something that um, Jo Hart would know all about because she has been a, a riding instructor. And, uh, so you, in the class, <coughs> we're hoping that they will all be riding. <coughs> um, and unaccompanied, you know, that they will, <coughs> will be able to ride without being led. Um, you'll find, hello B, I'm glad you're able to join us. Um, we're talking about um, what is gifted and I ask people to, um, to write on the board what they thought of um, when they think of the term gifted, when, when they hear somebody say that student is gifted, what do they think? Could you write yours in text in the, in the chat please? 
and you always have some <coughs> that are just not quite confident enough yet, or, uh, they don't have the ability, they don't have the confidence, or something like that. They haven't started to ride independently yet. They're at the stage where they're leading a horse around or <coughs> being led around on a horse. And then they get to the stage where they're comfortable with riding and they are comfortable with going all the different paces and some of the braver ones will actually stand up on the saddle and you might think, oh yes, these ones that are beginning to be standing up are probably ready to be doing something else, a bit more advanced maybe. And then the really bright ones will think about Roman riding. They'll <coughs> think about riding on two horses, one foot on each horse. And that's quite a bit above the average of the class. Um, <coughs> And it's quite obvious that they're above the level of the class and that we call them bright. But then, even beyond that, we have the gifted ones. And the gifted ones have chosen to ride on two cheetahs. Ride and ride, one foot on each cheetah. Um, so there's a wonderful comparison of the bright learner to the gifted learner <coughs> and so we're going to call these ones that are Roman riding on the two horses bright and the ones that are riding on the cheetahs gifted and we're going to have a closer look at this bright versus gifted. <coughs> now the bright one, bright student this is in class, knows the answers but the gifted one asks the questions. Um, <clears throat> the bright one is interested, but the gifted one is highly curious. The bright one is attentive, but the gifted one <clears throat> is mentally and physically involved. The bright one has good ideas. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the gifted one might have wild, silly ideas. The bright one works hard. The gifted one plays around, doesn't appear to be concentrating, but then when you test them, they test very well. Uh, <coughs> the bright one answers the questions, but the gifted one discusses it in detail and elaborates it. Now this is the main one. If you'd like to write a, put a circle around this one, um, <coughs> The bright ones are in the top group, but the gifted ones are beyond the top group. The bright ones listen with interest. The gifted ones show strong feelings and opinions. Uh, the bright ones learn with ease. The gifted ones possibly already know. And this one I found really interesting. <coughs> um, when we were asked how many ref repetitions did we think students needed for mastery, I guessed about oh, four to five maybe, but they say six to eight, whereas the gifted ones take only one or two repetitions for mastery. And that's another <coughs> really big important one. The right one understands ideas, but the gifted one constructs abstractions. This is one that, the next one is one that is very often um, a problem too. Bright ones enjoy peers, but the gifted ones prefer adults. Um, often can't find anybody in their class that they can really relate to at a deep level. Where the bright one grasps the meaning, the gifted one draws inferences from it. The right one completes the assignments. The gifted one initiates projects that are sort of related to it um, <clears throat> and may not complete the assignments. Um, the right one is receptive, but the gifted one is intense. The right one copies accurately, whereas the gifted one creates new designs. The 
bright one enjoys school, but the gifted one enjoys learning. And that's a really important distinction in there. The bright one absorbs information while the gifted one manipulates it. You could call the bright one a technician, whereas the gifted one is an inventor. The bright one is a good memoriser, <coughs> but the gifted one's a good guesser. Uh, the bright one will enjoy a straightforward sequential presentation, whereas the gifted one thrives on complexity and makes links between all sorts of things, likes to see an overview, um, doesn't like to learn step by step. The bright one is alert, but the gifted one is keenly observant. And this one is really important too. The bright one is pleased with their own learning, but the gifted one is highly self-critical. They can see how much more could be done and, <coughs> um, and they can see what adult excellence is and that's what they would like. And very often they're perfectionists and something that um, falls below that doesn't please them. Does anyone want to... Um, have a, a comment or um, say something on the microphone or write something in chat about that? Yes, go Joe. Okay, it, it looks to me, my, my sort of perception of that is I'd see it as each of those sort of rows is a continuum because I think I've known students who might fall into this column for sort of half or more of those, but yet in this one for the other. And I, I guess that's one of the things that makes it so difficult for us to decide um, whether, they're, whether we're looking at a gifted student or not. Yes, and you, are, you will find that it won't be for everything. You know, in some areas they'll be one, in some areas they'll be the other. Um, it is a a continuum. But then the next one um, we have, we're going to um, also put in the comparison to the creative learner because that's slightly different again. Um, yes, Carol, that's, um, you say I can see the value of these attributes in changing my approach to training. Yes. Um, what would you like to, to speak or text and say, what do you think you could change or would change? Hi, thank you, Joe. Uh, I was just busy making a comment there for a learner who is having some problems <laughs> keeping in this room. So uh, I was just giving LJ Conrad uh, some instructions there. Sorry to, to do that in the middle of that. Um, what I really thought about was when I came in just now and, and had a look at all those, I started to think about the adults for whom I'm providing training and mostly these days <clears throat> they are Toastmasters and they vary. Uh, I wouldn't dare to say to them in any way that I, I think that they're showing the attributes of a bright or a gifted learner. Um, because they probably already have that sort of opinion of themselves, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but what I'm learning from having a look at these different attributes is what I need to do to ensure that I am providing some engagement for those at the two levels. And I think it's tougher for the gifted learner, to be honest. You're talking to us, Joe, but you've turned your mic off. Ah, that's better. Um, thank you. Yes, I got a little note saying that my talk button was disabled. Uh, but I'm right again now, so we'll just cross our fingers that that, that um, continues to be okay. We're moving on to the next slide. Um, this is about... Um, 
comparing high achieving students to gifted learners and creative thinkers because most or a lot of people tend to think that a gifted learner is the same as being a high achiever and certainly some of the gifted learners achieve very highly and certainly some of the high achievers are gifted but it's not completely synonymous um, because not all the gifted learners as we're going to see as we go along are high achievers some of them underachieve for a variety of reasons um, and some of the high achievers have got there by hard work um, so um, <coughs> for instance a high achiever remembers the answers and is interested is, and is attentive um, the gifted learner poses unforeseen questions is curious um, and is selectively mentally engaged um, <coughs> Uh, Dr. Catherine Hookman has a lovely saying, the eyebrow crinkle zone. Uh, you want the students to have something that they can just reach for. It's just out of reach, but it's attainable. You don't want to be teaching way beyond where they're up to, and you don't want to be teaching something that they already mastered a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> so, whereas the creative thinker, will see exceptions and wonder about things and they'll daydream and they'll appear to be off task um, and the, um, the high achiever generates advanced ideas whereas the gifted one generates complex abstract ideas and the creative one overflows with ideas many of which may not ever be developed um, <coughs> but yeah just have has a wealth of, of thoughts and um, considerations and dreams. Um, I've got two of my Dabrowski dogs down here, um, <coughs> intellectual, the border collie, and imaginational, the little Bedlington terrier. Um, and the little imaginational, he's certainly one of these creative thinkers, one of these dreamers, whereas the intellectual stays very much with the topic at hand. Um, and the high achiever works hard to achieve. The gifted one knows it without working hard or with just expending a little bit of energy and um, study. And <coughs> the creative one plays around with ideas and concepts. Um, the high achiever answers the questions in detail. Um, the gifted learner ponders with depth and multiple perspectives and the creative one thinks about all sorts of new possibilities. Um, the, the high achiever is performing at the top of the group, the gifted learner is beyond the group and the creative thinker is in a group of his own. <laughs> and he's so often get this, this little dreamer that has completely their own thoughts which seem really strange to everybody else um, but have their own wonderful logic to it um, and some of the great inventions will come from this group of the dreamers. Um, the, um, the high achiever responds with interest and opinions. Um, the gifted learner exhibits um, strong opinions and feelings and from a multiple of perspectives uh, but the dreamer one, the, the creative one um, shares bizarre, sometimes conflicting opinions <laughs> the topic on hand is this and, um, and the creative one has a completely different um, idea about it um, <clears throat> the um, high achiever learns with ease the gifted learner already knows and the creative one says what's if, what if, how could we do it better or um, what if we tried to do that. Um, they say the high achiever needs six to eight repetitions for mastery and this one as I say that really surprised me but that's 
I've heard it from a few sources now, um, whereas the gifted one needs one to three repetitions to master, and <laughs> the um, creative one, they say, questions the need for mastery. <laughs> um, <coughs> or has a completely different thought about it. Yeah. Yes. Um, <coughs> the high achiever enjoys the company of age peers, whereas the gifted learner prefers intellectual peers, and the creative thinker prefers the company of other creative peers, but then still often likes to work alone. Yes. Which is the one you're saying you can go for? You go with this one. Um, yeah. If you if you want to um, there that's right questions for need for mastery yeah um, if you'd like to make any comments um, on the whiteboard you know put a circle around something or a star if you feel strongly about it or or a question mark if you don't agree um, you know feel encouraged to do that um, <coughs> the high achiever understands complex abstract humour, um, the gifted one creates complex abstract humour and um, the creative one just loves wild off the wall type humour. The high achiever grasps the meaning, completes assignments on time, um, the gifted learner infers and connects the concept, um, initiates all sorts of pro projects, um, and extensions, um, but may not necessarily finish on time, may just start and um, they've now had as much as they want to learn from that um, and therefore they'll, um, they'll just stop. <laughs> um, and the creative one also makes the mental leaps um, and chooses a few things <coughs> to work on, some of which won't ever be, be completed. Uh, <coughs> the high achiever is receptive, the gifted learner is intent, um, but the creative one is independent and unconventional. Uh, the high achiever is accurate and complete, uh, the gifted learner is original and continually developing, and um, the creative one is um, oh well, continually developing. I'm sorry, this is very small to get it on the on the page. It come out very small. Um, now, uh, the high achiever usually enjoys school. The gifted one enjoys self-directed learning, and the creative one enjoys creating. The high achiever absorbs information, the gifted one manipulates it, and the creative one improvises. So you could call the high achiever a technician, um, the gifted one an expert who abstracts beyond the field, and the creative one an inventor or idea generator. The high achiever memorises well. The gifted one guesses well, and the creative one brainstorms well. Um, typically, the um, high achiever will get A's. Um, the gifted one may not be motivated by, motivated by grades at all, and the creative one probably will not be. We could call the high achieving one able the gifted one intellectual and the creative one idiosyncratic. So that's another way of looking at things. Um, have, have you changed your thoughts at all on what you would say gifted was having heard the distinctions between bright and high achieving and gifted? Oh, I can see a lot of things in this chart that can develop in adulthood. Yes, that's true. That's true. 
Um, Phil, do you want to um, do you want to mention some of those? Uh, if anyone would like to speak on the microphone, please put your hand up, and um, and I can give you. Okay, go, Phil. Right, I think my partner's uh, turned her speakers down um, because, as um, Joe Fry knows, we uh, actually occupy the same physical room. Um, could I ask a moderator to take us back to that previous slide? Because I'd like to talk to that. Uh, my memory is not what it used to be when I was a, a kid. Um, for example, um, uh, we talk here about a gifted learner manipulates information. Um, that is a, a sort of thing that designers of experiments in the sciences do. Um, and it's not necessarily something that uh, would be evident as, as a child, because uh, certainly when I was a child, I certainly wouldn't have called myself a gifted or, or a creative thinker. Um, and in some things, I was in the uh, what you might call the, the higher achiever classes. But in terms of manipulating information when I was a kid, uh, just no way, it didn't happen. Um, I've never been able to memorize well. Um, and I don't guess and infer very well. Um, or certainly didn't when I was a, a child. Um, but if we go down to that third from the bottom is pleased with our learning, well I enjoy learning, is self-critical, well yeah, um, yeah I, I want to learn more. Um, and in some very specific areas, it never finished with the possibilities, which is why I'm always um, playing with, with software, um, because there are things that I want to do. Um, it, again, at the moment, my, one of my hobby horses is to do with you know, using computers to make um, interesting visual images. Um, but those were none of those aspects were, were really there um, when I was a child. Um, there were perhaps two exceptions, um, which was uh, I once um, renegotiated uh, an English writing task with the teacher, so that instead of handing him work every, every week, I handed him a much larger piece at the end of three months. Um, and my last year at high school, I, I decided to do my own physics experiment. Um, so you know, these are aspects of, that I recognise that I've developed in myself, um, sort of. As, as I've grown older, but I certainly wouldn't say they were there as, as a child. I'll drop the microphone now. Yeah, thank, thanks, Phil. Um, some, some of these things do develop later on, but some students have them, even when they're quite young, um, which is one of the, the hallmarks of that gifted group. And one of the main things about gifted, as we're going to see on the next one, is asynchrony. Um, we're moving on to the next next slide. Um, probably the main thing I think of when I think of giftedness, <laughs> giftedness is asynchrony. Um, and we have here the Columbus, Ohio group definition of giftedness. Um, which is my very favourite one. <coughs> it's giftedness is a synchronous development in which advanced cognitive abilities and heightened intensity combine to create experiences and awareness that are qualitatively different from the norm. This asynchrony increases with higher intellectual capacity. The uniqueness of the gifted renders them particularly vulnerable and requires modifications in parenting, teaching, and counselling in order to develop optimally. Um, <coughs> so it's a, um, a, that's for me a real hallmark of the gifted, that they are asynchronous. They don't fit in with their age group. Um, they don't fit in with the general population. We've got here the bell group, uh, the, bell, the bell curve of the IQ levels in the population and you can see that the higher the IQ goes up, the less 
people will be at that level within the population. Here we have a diagram called the rough estimate and uh, that's largely related to, it was by Deborah Ruff, and it's largely related to um, the age at which um, children start to do various things. Some of these gifted ones um, don't start till quite a bit later, but then, um, for instance, Einstein, he didn't, didn't talk until he was three or four or something, um, but some of them will, for instance, talk very early um, in complete sentences, um, and they'll show really complex thinking and relating one topic to another very early, this sort of thing. So <coughs> the, the, the age at which some of these things appear can be an indicator. Um, the, the number of repetitions for mastery is another uh, hallmark. Um, <coughs> gifted students need to be learning at the right pace and the right level and the right depth um, because chances are they have known a large amount of the work that would be for their age group. All oh, right, the next, we have a reminder of the next one. Oh dearie me, we're, we're not very far along at all. <laughs> um, <coughs> and we have about a quarter of an hour left. Um, Okay, well that's, that's our, um, what, what I usually think of um, in terms of what do we mean when we say gifted. But then also there is the possibility of a child being twice exceptional, um, having um, a very high IQ but also having um, learning difficulties or difference in learning style um, <coughs> which make it very hard for them to express how well they're understanding. Um, <coughs> and very often they appear as a, an average student because their gifts are being masked by their difficulties and their difficulties are hiding their giftedness. Um, so if you were drawing them Roman writing you would have them with one foot on the cheetah and one foot on the tortoise. Um, we won't go all the way through it, but there are distinguishing characteristics, two pages worth of that. Um, and there's a link here, um, which is a live link there, the small, in the small writing to that particular one, which talks about um, the difference between gifted and gifted students that have a learning dif difference or disability. <coughs> Gagne's model um, talks about the development of natural gifts into competencies. He calls it gifts to talents. Um, he talks about having a natural ability in an area. Um, and then the influences that um, play into whether that ability is ever fully developed into a talent or not. Um, and oh, um, is anybody else getting an echo, or is this just one person receiving that? No echo here. Ah, oh, yes, that's true. Yes, being logged in twice would explain that. Okay, uh, moving right along. Um, it is possible that gifted students are not high achievers because there are many reasons why they could be underachieving. Um, something to do with their, their home situation, for instance, or 
if their gifts and talents are not recognised, if they're not being adequately challenged, if they're completely unmotivated, if they're in poor health or living in poverty or isolation, um, if they're learning in a language other than their first language, um, if they're lacking support, any of those things can make any student underachieve and equally so with the gifted ones. The, um, the whole student population contains some gifted, some underachieving and some who have learning difficulties and then there's overlap between all those groups and it's the job of teachers and parents and psychologists and therapists to try and build a wall here, a guardrail, so that they're not going to fall into that underachieving area. What needs do teachers and parents of the gifted have? Um, they need to know what's normal. Um, normal for gifted, as Leslie Sword says, because there are a number of things which are very common in gifted students which are not common in the general population, like they're um, in the very minority group in the bell curve, they very often um, are very intense and sensitive um, and have Dabrowski's overexcitabilities, which is another whole um, session in itself. Um, they're Whereas an extrovert would be in the majority in the general population, um, it's the introvert who's um, more common in the gifted population. Very often they're perfectionists, many of them are visual spatial learners, um, and many of them are creative and we saw how the ones who are very creative think very differently. So all those things are normal for gifted, but can look quite strange. Um, so they need examples, they need good mentors, good teachers, um, they need to know what excellence is so that they can aim for it, they need extension so that they're learning at the right level and depth and speed, and they need extra information and misbusting because there's a lot of uh, myths about what gifted is and what it isn't and um, they need differentiation there again for speed, for level, for depth um, and they need dialogue and teamwork with the parents, the psychologists, the teachers all working together for the good of the student, um, not pushing their own barrow but all with the student's best interest at heart. And they need social opportunities, which um, are fairly difficult because they're in the minority in the general population and they need support. And the parents and teachers of the gifted certainly need support. They need to be with others who are um, like them and doing the same sort of thing as they are. Uh, um, so, have a, have a little look at this. What of these things do you think um, the different people would be needing? The teachers, the parents, you can take your pencil here and draw a line to uh, between the the box and, uh, and the information that you think they might need. Yes, teachers need PD. Yep, yes.
What about the gifted adults? What do you think they would need? Yeah, definitely the social groups, yeah. yeah. Coping strategies, yes. Yeah, yes, that's good. You can see the specific needs of all these different groups. And so how do you find all these things? Well, we need a signpost. Signposts point to places of interest. They're usually set up by somebody who knows where to find the information, and they're usually neutral and unbiased. And gifted resources aims to be a signpost like that to information about events and services and news for gifted people. Um, we aim to present information about services in an unbiased way. And I've placed them there um, according to locate services that I know about already. Um, uh, people get in touch with me if they're going to have, say, a guest speaker or a conference coming up, and I put them in our newsletter and on our website, and I'm just about to show you that. Um, how can gifted resources help you find it? All these smaller links are live ones, so you can click on those um, and open them up. Um, I won't go there right now, um, but um, somebody was asking earlier on about one of the charts and wanting to see it um, larger, etc., um, and see it for a bit longer. If you want to save um, this um, presentation, um, Joe Hart can tell you about that in a moment, um, and you can do a, a screen save at any time. So the sort of things, Gifted Resources has two blogs as well as a website, and these are the sort of topics on the blogs, um, about blogs and blogging and books and reading and bullying and children's literature and conferences and Dabrowski's overexcitabilities, Tobino six action shoes, depression in gifted people, film discussions, gifted programs, holiday celebrations, holiday programs. Um, homeschooling, memory, mind mapping, um, online conferences and webinars, organisation and study skills, social, emotional, friendship issues, twice exceptional students, visual spatial learners, and various um, web-based education tools. So we have a service locator uh, on Gifted Resources website. and gives you links to providers of different services. We have the extension and holiday programs and list of state gifted and talented associations and parent support groups, um, sources of teacher education and PD in gifted education and psychologists and education consultants, um, uh, a page about schools, a specific page about the select entry accelerated learning program schools in Victoria, um, and a few other things like that. Um, we have an in-tray um, and a calendar and um, an event calendar and uh, programs news on the main page of Gifted Resources website. The in-tray is um, where people send me flyers and pamphlets about things and I put them in there. Um, sometimes they might miss being published in the newsletter um, and they go in the in-tray. The newsletter comes out once a month um, with um, a special extra one just before each school holidays and you can read back copies online going back to 2005. Um, there's a picture of the, um, the most recent gifted resources email newsletter, the bit that you see when you go to the main page and then you can continue reading it in a PDF. Um, there's the index, typically those are the sort of things that the newsletter will contain. 
news of the activities of the parent support groups, um, guest speakers, conferences, um, different programs that are being run, and always a collection of interesting websites. There's a whole page about Columbus Cheese and Myth Buster, which you can look at, which talks about all the myths surrounding giftedness. Um, there's a, a whole page of articles, uh, interviews and presentations that I've given. Um, a number of them were for Joe Hart. Um, Feet Speak Two Issues is a program I wrote uh, for designing uh, gift programs for gifted students who also have a, a learning disability using the Bono's Six Action Shoes as a planning tool and plotting it against um, Gagne's developmental um, path, which we saw the diagram of before. There's a separate page about visual spatial learners, um, film discussions that I've written um, about films that relate to giftedness, website lists. Um, I'm Joe Fry on Twitter. Um, there's a wonderful chat about gifted um, items um, called GT Chat. And Lisa Conrad, who's been having a bit of trouble with um, actually getting into the room, um, she's the moderator for GT Chat, and it's once a week uh, and thoroughly enjoyable. There's uh, details there about how to participate in that. Um, both gifted resources, and, or both me personally and SpriteSide have a Facebook page. Um, and so, <laughs> I've finished, <laughs> I've done it in time. Any questions, any news, any comments, um, please stay in touch. Uh, Joe Fry on Twitter, that's my email address. And thank you very much for participating in this session and for uh, thank you for having me. And I'll hand back to Joe Hart. Thank you, Joe. I think we should all give Joe a round of um, Blackboard Collaborate applause. Whoops. Text wrong link as usual. Um, thank you, Joe. That was a terrific week through all the exciting things that you do. Um, and there will be an exit survey when, survey when you leave. And I'm going to put this in again because the next session is about start and is Sarah Stewart, um, who has been in my PLN since 2008. Um, telling us about delivering PD online, using social media, sorry, for delivering PD. And again, thank you, Joe, that was terrific. I'm going to stop the recording. I'm going to ask everybody, please, to remember to leave the room. Don't forget you can save this. <coughs> um, so if you want to, you need to go to File, Save, Whiteboard, and then choose um, when you, once you've selected all pages, choose PDF because other, if you save it as a whiteboard, you will only be able to open it again inside another Blackboard Collaborate room. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now.